For more than two decades, one man has represented a unique challenge to Western leaders. The quagmire created by Vladimir Putin's Presidency of Russia has only become more complicated since his invasion of Ukraine. The war has forced countries with previous close ties to Russia to reconsider their economic, political and defence policies in response to a renewed threat from the East. For other nations, their very existence is now threatened by the President in the Kremlin, who could at any moment decide to launch a war against them, as he did against Ukraine. Therefore, some have argued it should be a priority for the West to remove Putin from power, or at the very least, humiliate him with a crushing defeat on the battlefield. One US Senator, Lindsey Graham, even argued for a Russian Brutus or General Staffenberg to assassinate Putin. You need to take this guy out by any means uh, possible. However, others disagree, including the veteran diplomat Henry Kissinger, who says the West should apply pressure onto Ukraine to cede territory and end the war. Former U.S. Secretary of State Henry Kissinger is drawing major backlash from remarks that he made about Ukraine at the World Economic Forum. Kissinger suggested that Ukraine cede territory to make peace with Ukraine, with Russia. But Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky also addressed the gathering and said that Ukraine is fighting to reclaim, quote, all of its territories. Daniel Johnson has been reporting on foreign affairs for decades, including for a period as the Daily Telegraph's correspondent in Germany, where he covered the fall of the Berlin Wall. He firmly believes the West should aim to topple Putin. In my opinion, we have no choice but to aim for regime change, because as long as Putin is president of Russia, I'm afraid that the unprovoked attacks on his neighbours, which have characterised his entire period of rule, will continue. I don't think that certainly Eastern Europe, but even Central and Western Europe are safe until Putin has left office. I don't believe that that will happen immediately, but I think it is within the foreseeable future. I very much uh, agree with uh, Sir Richard Dearlove, the uh, former head of MI6, who believes that Putin is indeed a very sick man and that at some point in the next few months, he will have to step down because of ill health. But we can't count on that, of course, and the intelligence is very uncertain. You still find in Putin and his entourage this deep distrust of anyone uh, with Western connections. And I believe that this is underlying the invasion of, of Ukraine because he wants to re-establish a sphere of influence reaching far into Europe. And he is convinced that the West is fighting a proxy war against him in Ukraine. Benjamin Friedman is the policy director at the American think tank Defence Priorities. I sat down with Mr Friedman and asked whether he thought regime change in Russia should be the West's priority. It's become popular, at least rhetorically, to say that we want to inflict as much pain on Russia as possible, that we want Russia to go into an economic tailspin and possibly suffer so much that uh, it has a regime change and somebody else is in charge there. I think uh, that's a foolish goal for a couple of reasons. Number one, uh, it's not clear that we can even do that much economic damage to Russia through the war and sanctions because uh, they, they have, with their energy production, a fairly resilient economy. And the West is not the whole world. There's a lot of people buying uh, Russian energy in, in India and other, in China and other parts of the world. Besides that, I think that Russia's not going away. And the idea that we can just punish them into oblivion is incredibly short-sighted. Uh, they're going to remain uh, a great power with thousands of nuclear weapons, with a large chunk of uh, the world's energy market. So uh, I think we should want a settlement of the war uh, that fits uh, roughly uh, Ukraine's borders, but not entirely, because it's not realistic. And we should push Ukraine in the West, I think, to uh, accept that it's just not going to get all of its territory back and that it's never going to join NATO. And then we might have a chance, although I think the odds aren't great right now, for a settlement. Russia has a long history of regimes in crisis, from Tsar Nicholas II's Russian Empire to Mikhail Gorbachev's Soviet Union. It is not unprecedented 
for regimes to suddenly collapse in the world's largest country. So what lessons can we learn from these historic changes in leadership? And what might be the implications of removing Putin from power? I mean, essentially, it's that regimes fall from within. Um, if anything, we could actually go back to Vladimir Ilyich Ulyanov, i.e. Lenin, who said that basically revolutions succeed when there is a critical absence of will on the part of the elite. So in some ways, as long as, I mean, this is the sad truth, and it's a sad truth we've also seen in places like Tiananmen Square and elsewhere, that so long as a regime is united and is willing to use force, then basically it will prevail, whether it's against people power or domestic uh, sort of elite movements. Tsarism fell not because of the Bolsheviks. The Bolsheviks simply seized the opportunity afterwards. It fell precisely because a terrible war had led to a critical failure of this regime's legitimacy amongst both the population, but also the generals and the politicians and so forth. And at that point, a regime which had been based on a divine right monarchy, of course, collapsed because basically God's mandate is not something that you can just simply pass on and say, whoops, God made a mistake. Well, likewise, OK, it wasn't quite divine right, but maybe it was kind of dialectic right um, of, of the Marxist-Leninist regime in 1991. And this is that last point I'd make, best interests. Basically, elites are generally self-interested. They will support regimes that they think are winners and which benefit them. And as soon as they feel the regime is going to fall and that it isn't helping their interests, they will defect. And that's, so that's absolutely what happened in both cases. So this offers us some kind of, uh, sort of blueprint for the future. First of all, it happens from within. Secondly, it happens when the public is unhappy, but that the public don't actually displace the regime. They just create the context in which enough of the elite decide OK, that's it. We need a plan B. With Putin crushing down on his internal opponents in Russia, is regime change even possible? I don't think there's much prospect for Putin to go because he's, he has such profound support in Russia, whether we like it or not. Some of it uh, legitimate and some of it illegitimate in the sense of being won by coercion and repression. I do think that although Russia is not a democracy, there is real potential for popular uprisings. The structures of Russian society are such that you need to have a sort of bodyguard of men who are prepared to die for you. And the question is, does Putin have that? Other than his, his elite Chechen fighters, some of whom he keeps very nearby him in Moscow all the time, it's hard to see who is prepared to die for Putin. Henry Kissinger has argued a more hawkish position towards Russia could have unintended consequences for the West. We in the, in the West, in the United States in particular, have accidentally had a policy that pushes Russia and China together because we've decided that having uh, antagonistic relations with both states is a good idea for different reasons. There's a, a quasi-alliance arguably already but, uh, yeah, certainly I think we should all be concerned about that. I mean, if you look at the amount of global production capacity, the amount of the global economy that would be contained by those two powers, it, it's the kind of thing that would make, you know, the ghosts of realists like George Kennan and Hans Morgenthau wake up and say, well, that's really the thing you need to worry about is that kind of unity in, in Eurasia. That could really be a threat to the United States. That being said, I think there's limits to how much they'll cooperate because of uh, historical antagonism between them and because there, you know, there, there's uh, a fair amount of rivalry that between Russia and China that's not likely to go away. On the question of China and Kissinger, uh, it seems to me that China is playing a very cautious game with Putin at the moment. And they don't want to be associated with a loser. If Putin is defeated, far from that cementing the alliance between the two, I think it will, if anything, mean that Russia is downgraded uh, in Beijing. Even if removing Putin from power was a realistic goal for Western leaders, there is no knowing who might replace the Russian president, for good or evil. There's no other uh, obvious candidates to run Russia at this time. And I think it would be misguided to assume that you can do something about him being in charge. Besides that, if Russia did have a coup or some kind of sudden regime change, 
I think you're likely to get someone in charge of Russia who's not that dissimilar from Putin, whose goals are not wildly different. So I think a, a policy that aims at regime change uh, is just short-sighted and unlikely to work. And if it does work, it might do more harm than good. We need to look at the succession plan. There isn't really one, of course, but he's said to have appointed Nikolai Patrushev, the secretary of his National Security Council, a role that Putin himself held before he became president, as his temporary successor, if he should need to go into sanatorium for medical operations. Now, if we look at Patrushev, he's even more hawkish than, than Putin. He doesn't accept Ukraine as a real state. Uh, he's violently anti-Western. Uh, he's, he's certainly not going to mark a change in Russian uh, policy. On the other hand, he's only a faceless bureaucrat. He's never been elected. And I'm not sure that the Russian people will accept someone like that without trouble.